Hey guys, welcome to the party. We are the Weekend Rockstars, your weekly podcast for all the tips, tricks, and licks you need for getting started in music. I am Scott Freeman, and with me is Billy wearing a coat. Deadman, bloody cold. It's gone. It's it's gone a bit cold now, hasn't it? I haven't I haven't resorted to uh, putting the heating on yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is why I wear a coat now. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's gonna it's gonna happen soon though. The heating is gonna have to come on. Yeah. And the issue at the flat is that we have the electric heaters. Right. Uh, I don't know if you know this about electric heaters, but when you turn them on after many months of being off, yeah, you suddenly get this crusty, cheesy smell that comes from the dust being burnt off. Right. <laughs> There's okay. a layer of dust in there okay. that you can't clean off there. You just have to oh, wait for no. it to burn away. Okay. So you get this horrible smell. Right. So we, I'm putting that off. Oh, man, that's annoying. <laughs> that's That's really annoying. Um, it was weird, like, I'd come in here into the studio during the summer months, and because of the insulation, you know, where it got cool overnight, it'd be icy cold, it'd be like a freezer in here. Sometimes. Really? So, yeah. I thought like, it would always be hot. Yeah, you'd think so, yeah. you'd think so. Like a garden but, shed. Yeah, like, in the days, it it, it would, um, it'd be quite warm sometimes. Mm. Um, but, it, yeah, in the mornings, it could be icy cold, so I was putting on the heater uh, for a couple of minutes to warm it up in here, and yeah. then, like, i turn it off and go outside two hours later, yeah. and it'd be, like, 35 degrees out oh. there, or whatever crazy heat it got to in August. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we're definitely in autumn weather now, and, uh, yeah, I would say let's get onto an autumn subject. <laughs> That's a good pun. I appreciate that pun. Yeah, um, yeah so today we're going to be talking about uh, recording. And uh, we will I don't know how in-depth we're going to get into the whole process, but we're going to start at the beginning and see where we go. This might be like a multi-part thing, because recording such a big, a big yeah. thing. I feel like it's going to be like a bird's-eye view in yeah. that like I'm not... A, a, a recording engineer with a degree yeah so neither am i <laughs> yeah you can't you can't take my word as gospel but i can tell you about my experiences and my overall view of how things should be yeah yeah but that's something you have to follow that because sometimes you can do things outside the box okay yeah. so I'll, i want to get into our uh our process now mm-hmm. but first i want to flash back in time to your first experience recording take your mind back and what was it like what was the process like was it digital was it tape so f- first time recording uh anything or what well, music music like, like band, in ter- yeah, yeah but in terms of like recording um in a professional way or in like a more amateur way you know like your, your first band or whatever did yeah. you go into a studio and record like you know a bunch of tracks and they were really horrible or whatever like what was the i guess so in my first ever band we were just recording with a, a like just live demos that okay. we were just doing with like ba- literally one of those like microsoft pc microphones okay. you know the ones that come with like a little long stick yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounded awful like okay, yeah, uh, it, it was just, just distortion like uh yeah. throughout the Probably whole thing turn the game down a bit. yeah <laughs> uh so that was you know rubbish basically uh even back then we were practicing without a pa we were literally using um my friend's high hi- hi-fi that uh, he was just okay. running a microphone through. And it wasn't yeah, loud yeah. enough in, in the slightest, so <laughs> it was terrible. Um, and then I remember we, my friend, after that band, my friend at the time that we were starting a band with, he bought himself like this like eight-track recorder thing. Yeah. And both of us didn't have a clue how it worked. Yeah. So <laughs> we were like, how do, how do we do this? And we kind of figured out how to sort of record something, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it was not in time, and then we couldn't get the next thing to work, and it was like, didn't know what we were doing, didn't have PCs powerful enough to even run the software, really. Yeah. So it was a disaster. So all, all of that was just basically me and friends being idiots. Um, okay. It wasn't until I moved over to the UK and joined my first, like, proper band. Yeah. Uh, in Albany down and got the opportunity to record professionally at a proper studio oh, wow. okay. with a with a proper uh producer yeah big up mr greg haber yeah um 
who is a, a Welsh record producer. Uh, he has worked with um, the Manic Street Preachers, mm-hmm. uh, I think Stereophonics, uh, possibly Mel C. Okay, definitely Mel C. Things like that. big big name artists. He's worked and he's yeah. worked with he's worked with me, Billy Ooh, Deadman, really? <laughs> <laughs> or as he called me, uh, Bobby. He called you Bobby. He didn't know my name at first. He got my name <laughs> wrong, and literally for the first week of the recording session, he kept calling me Bobby, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I didn't correct him because um, uh, I was just you know being typical British, um, yeah, like too polite for my own good. Yeah. Uh, they, and then suddenly he realised, he's like, w- why didn't you correct me? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. He's like, he's like, from now on, you're Billy Bobby uh, to me. So yeah. that's why he always calls me Billy Bobby. You know, I don't think I've met a Bobby in adult life. I think, I, you know... Well, if you met a Robert, you could be like, they're Bobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Know? It always freaks me out when I'm watching a talk show and like they someone refers to Robert De Niro as Bob, you know, yeah. and I'm just like Robert De Niro, I'm Bob. <laughs> um, okay, so so you had sort of you know kind of your garage bands kind of trying to work out an eight track recorder and it not quite work. Didn't have a clue. Yeah, and then you you didn't you didn't go to like another recording studio between then. No. Your next jump was working with Greg Haver. Yeah, pretty much. Cause, <laughs> yeah, which was really awesome. I obviously. Um, a lot of money got spent uh, hiring him and his uh, engineer Clint Murphy and yeah. the studio we used which was called uh, Modern World Studios in Tetbury uh, which Where's is in the, in the Cotswolds right okay um, so it was a massive opportunity and um, in a way I guess like my whole philosophy on recording was is very much informed by that because I learned like so much over the three albums we did with them yeah um, just like the whole process and how and how they do it as professionals yeah. just informs like how I would do it in my bands following that. Yeah. Uh, and there is a pro- there's like a to me there's like a step by step process. Process. Okay. Yeah. Well, interesting. Cool, mm. man. Um so I I think my first ever recording session was in one of my first bands called Piranha and we were all 13, 12 at the time and our music teacher at the school said Oh, you know, um, stay after school, and uh, we've got we've got a tape recorder, nice. tape like eight track, wow. and these old things. And this, our, our music teacher, Mister LV, uh, he he was awesome, man. He was <laughs> he was a really cool guy. He taught like my uncle and like aunt, you know, <laughs> back in the eighties. Yeah. So like he he'd been around for a while, and. Um, he was just he was a really cool guy and so he had all this retro tech you know he hadn't transferred to digital yet you know <laughs> and so he recorded our first demo on tape and it was horrible and i i don't know what happened to it we we lost it yeah. that was probably the the first time uh, and then we actually with my next band which was called pink final we went into airplay studios which i know you rehearsed yep. at and it was in the early days of airplay where they were still offering recording mm-hmm. and so ian the guy who used to own it recorded yeah. our four or five track sort of ep mm-hmm. in there and um he had a little kind of yeah eight track digital recorder yeah so it was a step up from the tape and we pretty much played the song together you know yeah. uh, and then you know with me singing as well and then the band would go back over it and record just all the music over that guide track okay and then i'd yeah. come on and record the vocal solo yeah. at the end for for each track yeah. and so that was m- like my first introduction to like sort of multi-tracking and that yeah that sort of thing but man i've been to so many different studios all all across the place mm-hmm. I, I honestly i mean we've never really talked i know obviously your stuff with greg haver yeah but i honestly assumed all these years of knowing you yeah and like the musical stuff you've done that before you probably would have been to a whole bunch of other studios but you went from like the <laughs> yeah. garage to working with I, greg haver yeah i mean i've been to i had been to rehearsal studios yeah, obviously, yeah. but like but not so, recording yeah I never recorded anything yeah. I had no idea like what to do and wow. what it was gonna be, and um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, it, it it was really interesting just learning like the process, and I think we should like step by step go through that process. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So we'll, we'll start with you, Billy. Yeah. Um. So you've you've done a lot of recording yeah. since the days of uh you're, you're going in with Greg Haver for mm-hmm. the first time. You've obviously you were in Albany Down. You did three albums there. Yeah. 
Fuzz Walker and Brave yeah. Rival currently, yeah. Yeah. you know, and you've done you, you, you've done a live album with Brave Rival, yeah, and some other studio recordings. Yeah, I've done right. recordings in your album, first album. You've done recording on my album, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you've also. Um, yeah, well, Fuzz Walker, you've done a whole bunch of stuff there. Yeah, loads so, of songs and EPs. So that's, EPs. I imagine, yeah, for all these EPs and everything, like, mm-hmm. you know, there's probably been an evolution and lots of things you've picked up along the way. So what does your process look like now? So I say it's very informed by what I learned under Greg and Clint. Yeah. Um, so it's going to start with the uh, pre-production, okay. which is essentially, I mean, mo- it's... It's part of the songwriting, really, because like you've got the song, but it's it's kind of like where you polish the song right up and and you dissect every little every part of it to the point where you know exactly as a band how the song is structured. Every every everybody here knows their parts, uh, yeah. and it's t- it's got to be tight tighter than a than a duck's ass, as they might say in the industry. You know, Ooh. is that <laughs> or, what they say? <laughs> or, or or Greg might say tighter than a nun's cunt, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll bleep that out. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, got 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 to be really really tight. The whole song, um, uh, as I say, like everyone knows all their parts, and you've kind of like figured out roughly what you want to do sonically with the song. Yeah, in the studio, do you want to add this additional um, instruments like a string section or or a keyboard or something that's something that you normally have? Mm. Um, and do you want to have the drums to be uh, you know really big or do you want them to be a bit more poppy a bit more uh uh you know sharp poppy yeah kind of sound yeah 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 <laughs> uh so it's all about figuring out in the in the pre-production phase making notes uh, and, and figuring out the direction you want the, the particular songs to go and obviously if you're doing like an album you're gonna do like a whole bunch of songs in one go yeah um and so you, you figure that out ahead of time before you would go into the studio and start paying money for uh, someone's time to record you, obviously, uh, and and in in those days, Greg would actually come down to where we were rehearsing, and he would like have his own ideas as a producer on the songs, and be like, no, I don't like that, change that, do like that, do that better, or you know whatever. Yeah. So it, that really helped us, I think, as well as it, in a songwriting way as well, like in terms of um, tightening up the songs. Mm. Um, and in a weird way, when you work with a producer over many albums like that you kind of learn what they like and you start adjusting the songs in a way to a way that you know that they'll like anyway yeah yeah um and also you know what they don't like so if you add in something that the you know they're not going to like they might cut that out but they might keep the bit that you actually wanted to keep anyway it's a weird weird like task (laughs) went that way but interesting but but i think it does help make the songs better when you do get um that kind of like input sometimes but moving on from that so so you're at the studio right you've paid for the studio time and all that first mm-hmm. step uh is guide tracks yeah so when we did it with all down it would be uh the whole band in a room record the whole track live to mm. a click um and that would usually be quite painful if you had because at first we hadn't been used to playing with a click yeah so it'd be like constantly like Stop, do it again. Yeah. Stop, do it again. Why are you not playing the click? Play the click. <laughs> Play the click. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was, it was like, like, it really was like kind of stressful because I hadn't, I'd had never played to a click before. Uh, obviously, yeah. I played with drummers, but you, as a bass player, you're only as good as the drummer in a way. And the drummer wasn't particularly good at playing to a click either. Yeah. Um, it was a bit of a nightmare, but we got through that bit. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the thing about guide tracks is you don't have to do them, obviously, with the whole band, which is something I've learned since those. That's just how we did it. Yeah. And it was kind of it, it was kind of nice in a way because you have the whole textures of the whole song as a guide. But I think, uh, as I discovered with, like, Fuzz Walker and, and even recording yourself, sometimes yeah. you can get away with just the guitar as a guide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know about you. I mean, how do you do like guide tracks and stuff? Is you ju- you just doing it with your guitar it's, nowadays, or well, it's been an evolving process, you yeah. know. Um, you know, with with bands over the years, you know, we would we go into the studio, just record us playing, and then go back over and play our parts over the top of it and just yeah. tighten it up and 
you know that's how we do it and now since since i don't know what was it 2014 when i started recording season of blue with you Mm -hmm. and donna and tim um down in southampton um you know with that (laughs) that whole process was just was such a mess because (laughs) um we had we had a few hours rehearsal yeah the night before we went in and did the first lot of 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 tracks essentially were you there on the monday I with us. I think so. Yeah, I was there you for most the, of it. You were Monday and Thursday and Friday, I yeah, think. Yeah, I missed out on like one day or two days. I think, you, yeah, yeah, Tuesday and Wednesday, I think um, it was just me and Donna. Something like that. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we didn't do a lot of pre-production. We mm-hmm. did the least amount of pre-production mm-hmm. you could do. But to me, it didn't matter that much because I heard the songs in my head. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, if if I'd gone into the studio with really bad musicians who were really struggling to do what I was kind of describing, mm. I would have been humped. Yeah. You know, thankfully you suggested let's get Donna involved, yeah. and you volunteered to play, and I had yeah. Tim, so I was like, it's all gonna be okay, it's all gonna yeah. be okay, and so I was kind of in the studio. Donna was learning the songs, and I was kind of describing, oh, could you do triplets here? Could yeah. you do this? Oh, this bit? Can you do a feel like? Yeah. you know and stuff like that and you, kind of the same with yourself when you were doing the bass tracks i don't yeah. know if you were i mean it's, it's six years ago now yeah uh you know so if, if you remember what that process was like you, you were donning the producer cap yeah um and, and obviously there was that fella doing like engineering yeah, but, yeah. so having matt do the engineering yeah. i was kind of the producer and so i've yeah i've never actually worked with a producer proper i mean i've been to other little studios where the engineer will have will wear both hats yeah and will be like oh maybe you could try this out here you could sing this mm-hmm. and they've actually added to the songs yeah. here and there you know um but I've since doing all my own stuff, I've been the producer and that's been a skill I've had to, yeah, really develop over the years. Yeah. Because on the first album, it's really sparse in terms of in, like instrumentation. There's not a lot on it. There's some guitars, acoustic bass drums, a bit of tambourine and vocals. Yeah. And so it just sounds like the band playing in the room. Yeah. And then when it got to the second album, it's like, right, we're going to do pre-production for six months. Yeah. We're going to learn all these songs really well. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we're going to be super prepared for it. And then we're yeah. going to just overdub it to yeah. oblivion. Yeah. So there's like saxophones and viola and <laughs> <laughs> and Paul doing all these amazing yeah. organ bits and just, oh my word. And, you know, and oh, Tim put down some of his best guitar work ever yeah. on that. And yeah. it's just, and so we got to the end of the album and I listened to it and you're just like, whoa, like, yeah. <laughs> it's quite overwhelming. So I tried stripping it back on the third one and that didn't work it just got as big again um and so yeah now um my process is i kind of i'm doing most of the parts myself yeah and so i record the acoustic and vocal guide track to a click yeah. i'll do that and then i'll jump on and do the drums unless there's something where it really needs a bass to follow along to because yeah. sometimes when you're drumming along having that bass in the background i don't know it's, it's either comforting or it just makes some songs easier to follow so i was just recording my song the t-shirt song yeah um which i have to play in a bit because it sounds awesome <laughs> uh, anyway i've been doing that one and it's got this really syncopated rhythm to it yeah so i was like actually having the bass yeah on the guide will really help but yeah. for the most part it's just acoustic and vocal then i go and do the drum part myself and that's the trip for the most part the trickiest part yeah um you know because i hear the drums in my head but now i've got to do it. play to a <laughs> click and like my style is like I'm constantly like falling in and falling out of rhythm, like all these jagged little intersections. Yeah, so yeah. trying to get those right are really difficult. So yeah. I'll end up doing like 20 takes on the drums yeah. and then jump onto the bass, which I usually do in one take. Cause yeah. Unless I've got like you or Tom yeah. or like Gareth or someone else coming in and putting down magic. Yeah. I'm mostly just playing the root note. Um, and then acoustic after that and then electric guitars and then 
vocals, percussion that way. So I'll gradually multi-track it myself, and most of the time it will be just me playing on the tracks. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the occasion I'll get my friends in to play, and yeah. those that's always better. It's actually when I did the third album, I mostly did it by myself, and I realised at the end of the process it wasn't as fun, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to do it that way. Yeah. So now with the fourth album, I'm basically making, I'm recording all the tracks with all the instruments on them to get what's in my head yeah. onto a track that I can listen to and then send out to all my friends. Yeah. So and like go, a guide almost. Oh, then, almost a, as a yeah. pretty good yeah. guide and then yeah. have send it out to all my you know friends and say, what do you think? You got any ideas? Come in, pour your yeah. magic into it and let's make this thing even better. Yeah. So, so that's the process at yeah. the moment, but who knows, you know, so, so where yeah. it'll go. So yeah, like, so... Yeah, so the guide tracks, obviously, that's... So we did the guide tracks, right? Yeah. Um, Going back to, like, this process with Greg, right? Yeah. Um, And then from there, obviously, I say, you're building the... You're, build, you're using that as your canvas, almost, to then, as you say, like, get your... Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, you want to get your musician friends in to do all the parts and stuff, but... Yeah. Obviously, when it was... When we down, it would be ourselves. We we do the drums, we go first... Yeah. Uh, and so they would be able to hear the guy track in their headphones without their drum take from the guy take, and they'd have to obviously play yeah. the drums to to that. Then um, it obviously they do percussion next. So it's like there was always this order. It was always drums, percussion, bass. Um, you'd have a bass day where I do all the bass. We uh, bass day. Then bass. then then it would move on to like guitars. Yeah, uh, which would involve like obviously like the double tracking and the, the solos would come sort of after you've done all the chords and all the, all the mm. rhythm stuff. Then there'd be like the extras and stuff. So we get like string section in, or maybe uh, a backing singer in. The trumpets came in for one a couple of songs on the third album. I remember you sending. I yeah. can't remember which album it was you worked on the album down, but I remember you sending me a video. Yeah. Of like. You're in a proper good studio. I don't know if it was Modern World or something. Oh, it, must, it probably was, yeah. Anyway, you yeah. look off into one room and yeah. there's just all these people on, like... Yeah. There's a whole there's string section so, in yeah. there. I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, they were awesome. Um, so cool. So, yeah, like, and, and also keyboard... There's really awesome keyboardists that would come in and do the keys for the albums. And then once all that's sort of done, um, it would then move on to vocals. So you almost pretty much have the whole song basically constructed yeah for the vocalist to you know really feel it and then and then be able to sing passionately over it you know Mm. um and yeah once that's all done um and then obviously backing vocals after that so it's always like this step by step almost like you're you're constructing it from the bass of the of the rhythm uh rhythm section of the drums the bass and then everything else on top of that so it is kind of like it's like painting. I like. I think of it as like painting. Yeah. Know, in that in that way, kind of like you, you got to start off with your base colors and then, then add the flourishes on top. Then you know, add the, the colors. Flourishes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm not a painter, but I mm. kind of understand the metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's yeah. kind of like the the process. I mean, it's it is kind of like a bird's eye view, because I can't, I can't get really technical into like the mixing of it because that sort of comes afterwards with the, the cleverer brains would do it. I do know that on all the all the I'll be down albums they did do a thing where they would um they would take drum samples of each drum at various different uh pressures of hit. So like you know like a like a light bass drum, a heavy bass drum, yeah. a light snare hit, a really hard snare and and then they would have those samples to tidy things up a bit. Mm. um on takes and make it really uh sonically clear so yeah. they actually have someone a younger guy there that would just sort of go through it and edit the drum take yeah with the the drum samples to oh. make it really really tidy okay which is kind of cheating but apparently <laughs> that's what all the pros do that's apparently what dave Grohl would do apparently that's yeah. what he reckons <laughs> yeah yeah no i yeah. you know like the the editing part is um, do, doing the whole mixing thing myself. You mm. know, it's um, it's you know almost like my favourite part now because yeah. that's yeah when you get to t- make every little section sparkle when you mm-hmm. find you find things in there to just make the songs yeah pop a bit. Um, you know, um, 
So I think, yeah, the big difference between our processes is that my my pre-production and my production are kind of all yeah. scrambled together into one. It's not linear because it's just because it's just me. Whereas I, yours is a bit more. <laughs> I've I've kind of found though that my like that the way I I have worked with the produ- pre-production and that is loosened on some things like with fuzz walker and that we have sometimes just gone oh let's record this so we just end up like laying down a quick guide recording everything in, in one night you know yeah, yeah. Um, that's cool and and we might come up with ideas in the process while we're doing that on, on things we could add to it and stuff so it's, it's been more spur of the moment which has been fun to do that as well so it's been but i think having that foundation of knowing that that process before was helpful and also going in like and recording for the first time and not knowing how intense that was going to be in yeah. terms of like having to make sure everything was bang on in, in playing my parts because like and 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 there had, it was different tricks they could get around to make you sound good when you when you were a bit shit to be yeah. fair like they would make you just um drop you in for just the verses for example play those verses and then drop you in with just the choruses and then kind of stitch it together yeah um which was helpful if you were a bit shit like i was to begin with um and then by the third album i was able to just do full takes of the song yeah. without stopping um and i made like you know you do two takes and then they'd be like yeah that's great i yeah, will take those two and we'll just comp it from the best bits yeah. Um, so that was that was very really satisfying to get to that point. I I know I know yeah. that that cut up style. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. recently I've been recording my friend Rob here yeah. and uh, on our little secret project. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I, when we were doing the drums, he was like, "Oh, do you ju- want to just do like section by section?" I was like, "Nah, I want to do like yeah. whole takes. Yeah. And d- I want to do it royal blood style, like they did yeah. on their first album." <laughs> yeah. And he was like, "Okay." And so that lasted for like five hours, and then we got yeah. to the last hour, and I was just like, "I'm just gonna play the first now, <laughs> and then drum me in on the chorus," because just my patience and my mental energy yeah. was just gone from oh, playing yeah. all day. Um, but there's one like there's one song in that project which is like the hardest drum take, yeah. uh, the hardest drum um, drums on any of the songs, and it's all one take. Yeah. So I was really proud of that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I think sometimes as well you know your limits as well. So sometimes yeah. I, I come across a song which I'm playing, I know it's going to be a, like a total bitch to record mm. in one take, because uh, I like even live I might struggle with a particular part or something. Or it's just it just hasn't quite clicked for me yet. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you know what, let's just drop me in on that one bit. Or maybe you're doing um, sometimes though you you're dropping in for different parts just because you're changing the sound. So yeah. I, I think there was one song I don't think we even ended up releasing whatever it was that we recorded of this with Fuzz Walker, but we decided that we were going to do all the verses with a pick on the bass. Yeah. Um. So obviously I couldn't do that all in one take. So it was just like, and in the end, I'm so rubbish at playing with a pick that Matt had to play that with a pick. So <laughs> <laughs> he played your bass part with a pick. Yeah, I can't remember what song it was. We didn't release it. I don't think. I think it was um. What song? Oh, what was it? We released most of them. Yeah, I can't remember what one it was. Yeah. It was. It might have been Storm Stormshine, which hasn't come out yet, and we re-recorded that anyway, where I didn't use a pick. Yeah, but at one point we had a version with a pick part. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I don't know. So yeah, like and also uh, it works with solos as well, like guitar solos. Another another good tip I think uh, is ra- like something I've I've kind of bestowed on Ed as well um, to help him when it comes to recording solos. Yeah, uh, when it came like, in Fast Walker, is he would start agonizing over you know take after take i was like look we're just gonna do three takes mm. and um each time i'm gonna tell you to play them in some random way or like you know play it like a pyramid or something you know yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and and he responded well to that it's like if you just do three takes and we're just gonna either comp the best bits or we're just gonna use the best take yeah and then it's the most honest thing i was like you know just just go for it just go wild and um that's that's a good way of doing solos, I think. Just do three, maybe four, and just pick the best one. Yeah. yeah. Do you find it helpful when you're recording a part and then 
like a producer or whoever it is, Matt or someone says, mm. can you try it this way? Do you find that helpful or do you oh, find yeah. it distracting? Oh, you find it helpful. Yeah, no, yeah, in a way, because like sometimes I'll be playing a part and, and like I might be playing it too staccato yeah, and they want it more legato. Yeah, uh, and love those terms. Yeah, so so I'm playing it all like you know two 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 to guy, and they'd be like, oh, can you just play that a bit more legato, a bit more smoother? So about like, yeah, sure. So you know, yeah, uh, that that can help. Or um, I might sometimes get the rumble still skin. Yeah, uh, which is a technical term I believe for when your strings are. Um, rumbling <laughs> yeah 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 it's, so so if i'm having true. that they were like oh you, you're rumbling there a bit can you can you like it's the string you're not intending to play obviously is rumbling yeah so we can either um someone might hold that string so it doesn't rumble yeah <laughs> classic recording technique like just tape it up a bit yeah. or um i just have to play it better so <laughs> so you know not playing it so like casually almost because because you kind of there when you're playing any instrument i feel like you you're either playing it casually like and you don't really care about the e- extra rumble that you might be causing on yeah. the other strings it still sounds nice but you, when you're recording it you're isolating everything to such a degree where it needs to be pretty much perfect yeah um so you kind of need to play a bit better a bit more in- intensity on there same, same with volume as well like that i might be playing a part and then just due to mental fatigue i might start start playing it a bit lighter uh yeah. than i should be and they're like can you can you play that a bit louder um as you were earlier because otherwise it won't match up mm. um sound wave wise and it's like oh yeah of course so you gotta yeah, keep yeah. that intensity up bro you gotta yeah. keep it up yeah. Yeah. yeah um i find recording so annoying i both love it and hate it because mm. when i play live i can just sink into it like i know my songs so well oh, yeah. that yeah. i can just i can jump about and i can play the guitar and i can do all of that Yep. you know and i don't think about it too much i'm just doing it whereas in recording i have to really really focus on it yeah and remake it super tight to the point that once it's done even if it sounds really good to me it doesn't sound any good yeah you know i'm just like even with the one i've been recording today you know i'm just like i'm proud of it yeah. but i'm just like it sounds just better when it's just me jumping about with the acoustic it's, you know it's, it's that it's, weird um plight of any artist yeah. where you're always uh reaching for perfection which is always yeah. on the horizon you'll never reach it you're always reaching out for yeah. that nirvana almost but yeah um yeah, yeah. You're, you'll never you'll never quite get there yeah and that's it and that, i think that's part yeah. of why yeah. on on the third album why i didn't enjoy the process as much is because i'm so c- critical of myself yeah when it's all just me yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm like even more critical of it whereas with the second album all my favorite parts are like you know henry saxophone or nigel's yeah. you know violin playing or yeah. you know gareth's bass playing or something you know there's so many other people on it like yeah. it just i can just listen to their parts and just you know, I can just ignore me. Yeah. <laughs> Almost <laughs> sounds weird. I mean, yeah. but yeah. No, I, 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 I tell you, I feel like music is, is it should be quite collaborative, really. Yeah, because it is like a shared thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, that's been part of the experience of doing the third album isolated. I realised yeah. actually it does need to be collaborative, you yeah. know, because I thought on the first two albums, as much as I loved them, I was like, they're just all the little details I would just do slightly differently, you know, um, and that I didn't realise till later on yeah. or like when we are in the studio, I kind of liked what they were doing in place of what I told them to do, yeah. you know, um, but then later on I go, actually, now nah, I wish I did it my way, you yeah. know, you sort of, almost compromising on my own fish (laughs) you know because i feel like oh by doing that i'm being more collaborative yeah um so i don't know it's it's It's, a difficult it's also funny like going back and listening to the first album that i i was on yeah um and then comparing it to the third album or even the second album it's just it's so clear the progression of the whole band and the musicianship just went up another level on, on each album. Yeah. Um, and, and just the confidence in the studio as well. Yeah. Um, cause you can just tell like the first album is just, just way more overproduced yeah. just to get, just to make us sound good. Cause we must've been sounding shit. Like, <laughs> like obviously not shit, but we weren't like, we weren't brilliant. Yeah, I yeah. think looking back, we were like, 
we weren't as good as we were by the third album, and the second mm-hmm. album was a total step up as well. So yeah, um, yeah, the more the more experience you get in the studio uh, and recording, the the just the better you're gonna get. It's just because it is a skill. Yeah. Just like just like practicing your own instrument, uh, the studio is in a way its own instrument. It so, is. Yeah. It is. You know, learning how to learning how to record well and how to get the best out of your studio time is important, mm-hmm. especially like if you don't have your own studio space, like like I have here. You know, you, you know, if you're having to go into a place and yeah. pay twenty, thirty pounds an hour, maybe maybe more, depending yeah. on where it is. You're recording. Sorry, got the hiccups a little bit there. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but um, yeah, learning how to use that time well. You know, you can rent out the best studio in the world, but if you've not done good pre-production, you can really waste your time. Yeah, you know, um, it's a real, it's a real gamble. Yeah, you got. I think as, uh, pre-production is very important. Uh, I think we both agree, agree on that for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there who may be like, "Oh, I'm I'm not good enough yet to go into a studio and and do it." And I I, I guess I'd say to people like that, you know, it's like you just got to get in and start doing it, start recording, mm-hmm. you know, because you have to develop the skill of of recording. You know, yeah. it's almost like another instrument in yeah. in a way, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, you got to keep working on it. You got to get better at recording to a click. You got to get you know better at all that stuff you got you can't just hold back you know you're not you prompt your first album or ep or whatever probably isn't going to be perfect no but you know you know by doing more eventually you're going to get closer to perfection right yeah i i like being able to look back on things and and, and identify things like like yeah it's not the best it could have been but yeah. it's nice to see that progression i think as well yeah yeah definitely mm. i mean if you could go back to yourself if you could jump through a time portal <laughs> at, back to whenever it was you were recording. 2010, I think 10 it was. you were recording. 10 with, years ago. Yeah. yeah, so 10 years ago. That's and t- and give your... Well, maybe it was 2000... Yeah, but I, it's probably about then. Anyway, <laughs> so in this hypothetical time portal situation, yeah. we're jumping back 10 years or so to tell yourself just before you're about to go in the studio, mm. if you give yourself you know, one to three pieces of advice before you go in, what what would it be? Um, I would say that I, w- I would probably tell myself to don't worry too much about um, sucking at, like, the click. Yeah. Because um, you will get it. You just got to, you just got to, you know, really concentrate and you will get it. Yeah. Um, and just in, yeah I don't it's hard for me to think of the other two things to say really I guess okay. um, but we can pick up on that on the click actually because yeah. I think the click is an interesting thing so if you're yeah. listening and you're like what are they talking about the click the click yeah. is basically you know um, the metronome you know yeah. it's uh, you set the, the BPM Boop. to yeah Boop. <laughs> yeah, especially your heartbeat monitor. Um, yeah. You set it to whatever BPM, you know. Uh, usually it will be in the 100 to 200 range. You know, it could be faster, you know. Um, it could be half time. It could be half time, yeah. yeah. It could be playing jazz. It could be at 80. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but for the most part, have have you have you recorded songs where the BPM changes? Yeah, we did. Um, and have you changed the class Walker? And I think we just did those parts separate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember Greg uh, Haber bringing this up. Actually, this was years before that, saying like it's it's just just to avoid it because it is it's just not worth the hassle. He yeah. said. <laughs> but I guess some people want to do it sometimes, and we did want to do it with that Fuzz Walker song, and we we pulled it off, but it was tricky because yeah. you have to like. You can either try and do it live, and you have to be really, 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 like, shit hot, tight, or yeah. you can sort of do the studio magic to, like, just record each part separately, almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what song it was now. I'm trying to think now, was it? Hmm. No, it's gone. No. What song was it? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I wasn't what? there. Why is my brain <laughs> going, buddy? <laughs> but, yeah, so going back to it. So, you, your metronome, it's your bip, boop, boop, boop. Beep, boop, 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 
boom, if you're bam, playing in 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. Um, so that's your, your metronome. And the idea is that you're going to play along to the metronome, not go out of time. So if it's going, bam, boom, boom. Boom, you're not going to be playing dun, 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 yeah. like over oh, the map you've got to be like if it's dun 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 you can be boom ba, yeah. ba, ba, boom but you know you got to play play and, on and the also, yeah, also like I think the reason why they do that as well is digitally each beep can be like locked onto a line on the program that yeah. you're recording in and then you can just snap things in and out of place much easier than if like yeah. I don't. I guess they did use clicks back in the day on tape, but I don't know how useful that would have been for editing. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's just to keep the songs tight. I yeah, guess. Yeah. And yeah, like it does make the songs tighter. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to before I have a musician come in and play on a track, I have to check with them. It's like you're okay playing to a click, right? Mm. You know, it's more important with you know the the bass basic instruments like your, your your drums your bass and your guitar yeah you know um when you've got a violin or whatever they don't need to use a click at that point uh, you know it's mostly for laying down yeah, the foundation the foundations and then once you've got that you can usually turn the click off for the ancillary parts mm. of the song um but y- you need that and yeah when I've, some people were like no i won't play to a click <laughs> The whole thing can just get so messy. Yeah, it's, it's just, yeah. And the songs don't sound as good. No, it's like, you know, it's with her. Um, I remember reading an interview with Josh Homme. I was just about to say, Of yeah. Queens of Stone Age. He reckons that their last Queens of Stone Age album, that they didn't play to a click. Yeah. Because he reckons it, and that was produced by um, Mark, Mark Bronson. Bronson. Yeah. Uh, and he reckons that, you know, no, we don't use click because... Um, you know, ruins the atmosphere, and uh, you know it's it's live. You know, it's it's real. Yeah, uh, it, it, I was like bullshit. That is <laughs> definitely. I mean, I, I haven't put it, I haven't put to a click to to test, but I yeah. feel like it's that has got to have been recorded to a click. It's so slick and rhythmic. I'd yeah. be surprised if it wasn't. No way. You know. Um. Yeah. Y- you need it. You I need feel like it. that is Josh going off on one, being a crazy man like he is. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure there probably are professional bands that don't use it. Well, yeah, I mean, like you got you, you, you got your kind of bands that like jam stuff out. Like, I imagine the Jimi Hendrix Experience probably didn't use a click much back in the day because <laughs> they were just jamming in the studio. Especially on something like like on um, the Electric Ladyland album, there's that extended Voodoo Child. Um, not not. Yeah the one at the end of the album the one in the middle okay. that's literally just like 10 minutes of just a band jamming in a room and you can even hear people talking in the background and stuff yeah like that's just that's just not to a click that's just people jamming yeah. um and it's just live and and in a way you know thinking about it, um with brave rival on that um we're obviously planning our next album yeah and the producer fellow that we've um gonna work with uh, he was talking about he he was thinking about whether we could maybe do some songs in like a, in that sort of fashion where we just jam it out and then overdub some stuff over it like solos and stuff. And it might be interesting to see how that turns out. I've never really done it that way before. Yeah. Um, maybe it does come off with like a nice live feel, no click. But I don't know. I feel I part of me is also like, well, I know if we do it with a click, it's going to be tight as a you know, nuns, what's it? So. <laughs> She's got, oh, what's it now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, for me, when I play along to a click, um, usually when I'm doing the guide track, I need to constantly stay aware of it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I will either, I will usually tap my foot on the floor yep. as I'm doing it along with it, so I've constantly got that going. Yeah. So my body's physically moving with the metro. I, I do the same. You do the same, yeah? Yeah. yeah. That's always, that's always been my, yeah. my thing in order to keep to it. I've, you know, I need to, my whole body needs to be in on the click yeah. in order to keep it. Otherwise, I just fall out of it. It's really weird, obviously, as well, like playing uh, with headphones on in a studio with with this click. Cause it, it, sometimes it, the volume of it can be so overpowering yeah. in the music. It's like it's really horrible sounding. But uh, it's just one of the things you've got to learn to deal with if you're going to do it professionally, really. Yeah. yeah. And so in the studio, obviously, I talked about before, like I would, you know, when we would record the album. So when I do it here, I use the click. Uh, for the guy track, then the drums, and then the bass. 
uh, and then that's it. After that, I turn it off and I just play along to the rest of the instruments. Uh, I got that advice from um, someone I know who used to work at a recording studio years ago, mm. and they said, yeah, once you've got that tight, then just play along to it, and uh, now I have a good feel to it. Mm. So that's how I've done it ever since. Mm. Do you guys ha- do it like that, or do you keep the click on the entire time? I think only really... F- get the click's only really on for drums, bass, and rhythm guitar. Rhythm guitar, really? Yeah. Maybe... No, that's pretty... I, Pretty it really. I mean, it might be on very lightly for something else, but yeah, it's only, only really drums, bass, and rhythm guitar. Make sure everything's in time. Make sure, make sure everything's coming in on the one, for example. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 That damn click. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Um, I find there's lots. Of, there's lots of little tricks you can throw in. One thing I've I've found over the years is um, using a guitar slide. Um, for sections where I just want a, a whooshing sound to yeah. come in to just transition a section, like there'll just be a, you'll be playing along the song, you'll be listening back to it, and and you go, oh, there's a bit there where it's just a bit empty, mm-hmm. and so I'll just get a slide and just I won't I won't play it like a slide yeah. guitar. I will just drag it across the frets to just yeah. get a whoop yeah. kind of sound to to kind of put in there. Yeah. I like adding little bits like that. Yeah, making like messing around effects. with uh, pedals and stuff can be fun as well. Yeah, um, play around my big muff. Yeah, um, that's a guitar pedal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got my Octaver and I've got my synth and stuff. So, yeah, messing around pedals can be fun as well. And uh, yeah, especially, like, um, guitar sounds. I think that's the the most fun I have is, is helping or just listening and taking part in the recording of the guitars. Because yeah. you can – I think that's where you, the songs really start coming to life is obviously you've got that, that instrument being added. Yeah. Um, and you can, like – you know, oh, should we use this guitar? No, let's use that guitar for this bit. And you know, verses can be this guitar, choruses can be that guitar, and and then mm. we'll double track that chorus and yeah. we'll add um, maybe a little sprinkle of this to that bit. Yeah, yeah that's all all very good fun. So you bit. like producing? I do. I I I I really enjoy that process. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. Mm. There you go. Well, we were talking before the show started about you know because of everything going on with covid mm. our potential other businesses billy there you go <laughs> become a come producer i would i would love to, i the thing is obviously i would need an engineer yes i i, I have no idea i was yeah. I, that's that's one thing i i would love to i'd love to do that but i feel like yeah i would need an, an engineer and i would need people to trust me when it comes to my musical n- uh, know-how yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i feel like i have a good ear for things but yeah i don't know Part of its experience as well. You've yeah. got some really good experience. So am I know? blowing my own trumpet? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no. I mean, you you see on album sleeves, you know, um, you know, for when we used to buy albums mm. and not just listen to them digitally, you know. But you'd look on the sleeve, and I'd look at you know who worked on the album, yeah. And you'd see sometimes it just be producer credit, and then just the band members, and then like you know listing the studio and everything but then sometimes you'd have a separate producer credit and then a separate engineer mm-hmm. so you know the pro- and I, I always think there oh the producer wasn't a very good engineer clearly <laughs> uh, had to <laughs> had to get in that way but then like i've watched um you know on mtv or, or youtube or whatever about you know famous producers rick rubin or whatever mm. working with the chili peppers and you know they say sometimes i'm more of an engineer sometimes i'm more of a producer you know they they move hats around and yeah uh, yeah, i don't think you have to be a great engineer to be a producer there's other elements to it as well though like obviously greg knows how to use like pro tools stuff but i think he would get clint in just because clint was like a pro expert at it and it leaves uh it lets greg be able to handle a lot of other things such as um just basically he would di- he'd be almost like director in the director's chair yeah. telling everyone what to do mm. and also he would handle a lot of other things like budget concerns keeping everything within the budget that was set with management of the band yeah. uh, and making sure everything hits on the right deadline so going back to that process that, that the overall thing about the, the, each he would plan out the, the whole session like for me it's a two week session and he'd have each day 
is this, 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 and this. And he would keep us informed if that's going to change because of time maybe going over on a certain instrument and yeah. stuff. So, and it would, he'd book in the other musicians. So the producer has that other cap, I think, of like managing the whole project in, the, in a certain yeah. way. Which managing personalities as well. Oh, definitely, studio. yeah. Because like, you, you could have someone that um, takes offence to being told to play something different. We, yeah. Luckily, we never really had that. But I think... You've not had that in any of your bands? Not so much that. I think he could be a little harsh on the drummers because he is a drummer. Ah. Um, which wasn't a problem for Donna in that... Because she was a good player, so she didn't really have to be picked up on much. And yeah. Yeah. D- Damien was also a good play. Again, he didn't have to get picked up much. Johnny, though, poor Johnny was like ripped to shreds a lot. Just wow, he wasn't really? Very good. Uh, yeah, I, uh, my I thought he was a good drummer. He was. He was a good drummer in that he could play, but he couldn't really um, play to a click. He couldn't really ah. uh, play the same thing twice, which is very important because mm. when you're playing a part, you need to play the part exactly the same every time. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I remember <laughs> my one of my favorite lines was when he played a part and he was like all happy with himself. He just he just finished a take, yeah. and Greg was like, "Oh, that was great, Johnny. Can you play it again? But this time, don't play it like a cunt." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, You've so, told me that one before. Yeah. Oh man. So yeah, I think he was always a bit harsh on the drummers, and then when he got to the singers, he was way less harsh on the singers. Yeah. Because the singers, can, as he in his own words, could be a bit more precious, obviously. Yes. Uh, he was always a bit hard on me at first, like, um, like you know, I was always trying to add these runs in and stuff that were just totally unnecessary, and they didn't add any of the song. And he's like, "Why are you playing that? It's just, it sounds shit. Just don't yeah. do that." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." So it definitely helped improve me as a player, like the whole uh process um so yeah yeah i like the whole producing process i mean i i, I like doing it by myself but I, I like it when i get to work with someone um and, and do it that way and mm. shape it so i i yeah i loved all the stuff in the studio mm-hmm. when we were in southampton um well on the second album with with tim you know when he was actually no I'm the first album actually with Tim when he was doing a lot of the guitar solos yeah you know because he came from a church background where yeah. like didn't really have big guitar solos like they'd have lead parts so he was really good at coming up with creative lead parts that fit the song yeah but like when it came to guitar solos he was really good at it but just it wasn't his you know forte forte and so he was always being really restrained yeah he was still playing in the church band so i kept having to open the fridge door because it yeah it's southampton <laughs> for you guys listening this little studio by the train station in southampton called untapped talent amazing place um love matt and the team there um you, you got this big room and then the bit you record in is this basic massive refrigerator in the corner yeah. you know which you got this big chunky handle that you got to gear soundproof up soundproof door yeah. this huge soundproof door it's so cool I love yeah. it um, and so yeah every time you want to let someone out you got to open it up and pull it pull it open you almost imagine dry ice to pour out <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get some fog and i'd just be like play the solo sexier and then uh, shut it back and i don't know what effect it had, <laughs> but i think it became fun i said that like seven times in a row yeah for like seven takes and i think th- what it did was eventually he relaxed a bit more and didn't yeah. take it as seriously and i think the solo became sexier because <laughs> of that <laughs> yeah so but I, yeah i like it you know the other week tom came and recorded a part for a ukulele song i did and he came in and uh he put down a bass line it was a really cool bass line but when i was mixing it i was realizing that the ukulele is so high end mm-hmm. you really need a deep low end to make yeah. it stand out and what tom did was really mid-range yeah um and so i had to kind of have him come back in so I drive to New Malden again, get and bring him here, yeah. and then be like, do it all again, just play it on the fifth fret, yeah. you know, on the top string, and get the chunkiness. And yeah. you know, he was a bit disappointed because he really liked what he did. But yeah. after listening back, he was like, actually, now you're right. Like it does need that that yeah. deep thing. And yeah. I think, yeah, through doing all the mixing stuff, it's possibly made me a better producer because it's made me more aware of having to capture the different frequencies. Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. part of it, isn't it? Mm-hmm yeah um 
Cool. Mm. Right. Anything else you got to say on the subject, Billy? Well, I think we've covered all the uh, the bases. I think we have, yeah. yeah. And so, yes, this has been our sort of kind of like dive into our recording processes. Um, let us know in the comments, like, if you do things completely differently. I'm really fascinated to hear other people's processes and how yeah. they record because, I, I mean, I'm always looking to experiment and try new things and grow uh i'm sure as billy is mm -hmm. you know and so i'd be really interested to hear that um and let us know what you think of our processes um yeah this has been really fun billy yeah it's been good it's been good okay cool beans right well we're gonna sign out now so we have been the weekend rock stars i'm scott freeman and i'm billy debman and uh, we'll see you next time peace see you later